journey of the orca and baleen whale, the wild coast of Patagonia at the southern tip of the South American continent. Here, it is nature's calendar that determines the times that fascinating animals from the southern polar regions pass along the coast. Marine animals from large whales to seals, sea lions, and orcas, as well as millions of pigeons, are among the regular seasonal visitors. There is hardly anywhere else on Earth where one can so closely observe and experience both the gruesome side of nature as well as the more charming and delightful times. Many of the animals come here to mate and raise their young before continuing their long voyages through the Atlantic and other oceans of the world. Puerto Piramides on the Valdez Peninsula in the Argentinian province of Cubut form one of the most distinctive landscapes in Patagonia. Here on the coast, Jorges Schmidt, one of the first whale researchers, established an observation station to study the annual visit of Antarctic baleen whales in the Bay of Valdez. Today, what used to be a lonely station located at the farthest corner of the Earth has become a popular meeting point for many researchers and a center for whale watching tourism. The nature lover tours are limited and provide the state with funds to cover the costs of actively protecting the animals. Otherwise, instead of baby whales being born here, the extraction of underground raw materials would have destroyed this paradise long ago. The young whales are nursed by their mothers for three months until they are strong enough to survive the long journey to the Antarctic. Baby whales develop the final multiple fat layers under their skin gradually. At this stage in its growth, we can't really tell for certain whether this young albino whale is really just enjoying snuggling with his mama or not. As with all babies, the young whales are not yet able to discern between friend and foe, so it is critical not to get too close to the animals with the whale watching boats. For them, the boats are just another marine life form that doesn't do them any harm. Frank Worth, one of the established whale watching tour guides, is familiar with this problem. Later on on the high seas, the young animals don't recognize the propeller sound of large ocean going vessels as a danger. Thus, unhappy encounters between whales and ships occur time and again on the major shipping routes. The primary danger, however, is that they don't recognize the whaling vessels active in the world's oceans as enemies. Science has not yet fully understood why whales breach or leap out of the water. It could be a demonstration of strength just having fun, shaking off parasites, paralyzing schools of fish, or a threatening gesture. For the nature filmmaker, the reason for the behavior is nearly beside the point. It is simply fascinating to experience this natural spectacle and to be able to capture it on camera. The whales will often breed several times in succession. At another location, one humpbacked whale is said to have performed this feat 130 times in a row. A whale uses a lot of energy for that kind of activity. By the way, getting this close to the whales is not without risk. 
One unexpected move of the whale's massive head can give the diver a serious knock without the animal intending to do any harm. At night, krill rises from the ocean depths toward the surface. Swimming close to the ocean surface, baleen whales filter these small life forms and crustaceans from the water with the beard-like three-sided baleen plates located in their upper jaw, thereby gaining enormous amounts of nutrition. It is amazing that the energy they gain in this way is not only sufficient for their normal function, but that it also allows them to grow to their gigantic physical size. The weather is unpredictable along Patagonia's rugged coast. Perfect one day, the next day the seas can be so rough that there is no way for us to even think about filming on the water. But Patagonia's broad, expansive karst landscape provides the artistic eye of the cameraman with impressive scenes on land as well. You just need to maintain a good hold on your equipment. The wind can easily develop sudden gusts that nearly take your feet right out from under you. Almost constant winds carry sand across the land, creating wandering dunes. The dunes can cover the vegetation for several decades and sometimes even centuries, and then move on to eventually expose it again. This, by the way, is how most roads look in this uninhabited landscape. As desolate and formidable nature might look from a human standpoint, the animal kingdom adapts to this environment. The fox does not go hungry here. Tasty armadillos are available in abundance, for example. Brush fires are not unusual in this dry environment, and the often brisk winds fan the flames like a bellows. Under certain weather conditions, a wall of fire like this one can rage across the land at speeds of up to 50 kilometers per hour. Birds and larger animals might be able to escape, but smaller creatures and young birds in their nests don't stand a chance of surviving the inferno. Fire has a cleansing effect on the land and provides scavengers with a feast of grilled carrion. The wildlife regains its calm, and the guanacos and maras quickly get back to their primary activity, grazing.
They share their territory with the greater rhea, a flightless bird related to the African ostrich or the Australian emu. This type of steppe and the origin of the flora and fauna found here shares a strong similarity to South Africa and the southern and southwestern parts of Australia. That supports the theory of drifting continental plates after the original continent of Gondwana broke apart. In Punta Tombo, we observe the peaceful and almost cute coexistence between the species. The guanacos like to visit the Magellan penguin colonies. The little guys have nothing to fear from the large four-legged creatures. The armadillos are a different story. They head straight for the penguin caves. Their goal is to get at the tasty penguin eggs. But somehow they must have missed the course on penguin breeding in armadillo school. Penguins don't lay eggs at this time of year. But with a bit of luck, they might find unhatched eggs from the last breeding season, or dead chicks as they dig around in the soil. The penguin's evolutionary development into flightless seabirds is shown as they molt or lose their feathers. In fact, three watertight layers of short, densely spaced feathers grow on the skin of the animals. There are no areas on their bodies without feathers, as is the case with other birds. During molting, penguins use up a large portion of their fat reserves. And because molting follows the strenuous period of raising their young, this time becomes a serious fight for survival for these unique creatures. The weather has calmed down and we are able to get a bird's eye overview of the world spread out below us. The whale slapping the surface of the water with its tail, so-called fluking, is an aggressive signal in this case and means get out of here, large bird. The whale would have no way of knowing what a drone is, of course. It is primarily the sound that irritates the mammal. In order to spare them that stress, flying over whales with drones has been forbidden in the meantime. And then even the technology failed. 
A gust of wind caused the drone to land too violently, causing enough damage to the aircraft that it could no longer fly. But our colleague is a gifted handyman and is able to repair the unit. A bit of fine wire here, a bit of soldering there, a steady hand and a lot of patience pay off, and he is able to get the drone back in the air. In the meantime, the rest of the crew heads back out onto the rough sea. And we have an audience, the penguins, or shall we call them voyeurs. By this time, the bull whales have arrived in the bay and are singing their mating songs to the females. Marine biologists assume that even genetic information is communicated in the songs and that the females are attracted to the bull that will give their young the best genes. Then she allows the male to mate with her. The mating of the whales is not an easy matter. Even though the water carries most of the weight of the giants, they still cannot be as wild as a dolphin during copulation. When the genetically best suited mating partner has been established, the bull turns over on his back and the female lays herself over him, allowing his sexual organ to enter into her. This mating dance of the whale has rarely been captured on camera. The cameraman takes a great personal risk to film this tender, procreative moment between two giants the size of submarines. Once insemination is complete, the bull retracts his sexual organ back into the folds of his abdomen. Well, look at that. Our giant electronic bumblebee is in the air again. But its bird's eye view suggests that there is more going on than a tender mating encounter of the visitors from the South Pole. 
on the long inlet of Caleta Valdez, southern elephant seals gather to mate, bear their young, and enjoy sunbathing on the beach. For most of the rest of the year, the elephant seals spend their time alone. For the orcas, this means waiting until the first young animals make their way into the water. They patrol along the beaches, waiting patiently. Adult elephant seals are too big and too aggressive for the intelligent killer whales. And patience is the most important characteristic of a good hunter. By the way, in nature, nearly everything finds its use, including the afterbirth of the elephant seal. It provides the seagull with a nutritious meal. The orcas pose no threat to the large mother animals. The killer whales wait for the first inexperienced young animals to explore the water. We take advantage of the time to visit one of Patagonian's spectacular national memorials, the petrified forests of Sarmiento. In primeval times, this was a lush habitat for many types of dinosaur. Today, it is a bizarre but impressive and unique former desert landscape. According to some scientists, primitive evergreen forests covered this area about 65 million years ago. Then, at some point, tectonic upheavals and volcanic eruptions or a massive meteor impact must have occurred, killing off fungi and bacteria which would have otherwise broken down the organic material that now stands petrified. Even microorganisms need oxygen to do their work. The ground in the petrified forest of Sarmiento consists of dense layers of ash and baked sand like layers found in other areas of the world where fossils were formed under similar conditions. Photosynthesis, which produces oxygen, is not possible under these conditions. The many preserved petrified trees allow paleontologists to draw conclusions about plants that existed at a time long before mankind would be expected to have even existed. So what the layman sees as a breathtaking karst landscape is like a chapter in the history book of Earth's natural organisms for the experts. A side trip from the coast to Sarmiento is a bit different than visiting the Alps from Munich in Germany. In Patagonia, which is nine times as big as Austria on the Argentinian side alone, distances take on a whole new meaning. By the end of our little side trip, we had traveled more than 1,000 kilometers. The 
colonies of rockhopper penguins also find a home along the rugged coast with its many small inlets and rocky islands. It is breeding season and the couples are busy preparing their nests. Rockhopper penguins belong to the crested penguin family, so called because of the feathered crest on their heads. As the smallest of their kind, they grow to a height of only half a meter. In spite of their small size, they are relatively aggressive and defend their nest against any attacker. In their communal behavior, they treat one another very lovingly. Breeding season begins early October. The males arrive at the nesting grounds first. A few days later, the females arrive. Unfortunately, the population has been falling dramatically over the past 30 years. The reason is that even krill, the major source of nutrition for the rockhopper penguins, is being overfished in the meantime. That has hit the colonies on the Falkland Islands particularly hard. A good 88% of the animals originally counted there have been lost. Without sufficient food, the animals are not able to build up the necessary fat reserves to carry them through the long breeding period and the following molting process, and they die. Birds build their nests in vastly different ways. Some, like the stork or the eagle, build nests in the heights, while others simply scoop a small hole out of the ground. That is the way of the penguin. A small indentation in the cliff, which they can pad with a bit of moss and other bits of vegetation or even seaweed, is enough for the rockhopper penguin. Here they brood on the eggs in three shifts per day, one together and the other two alternatively. That gives the other partner time to feed. After about 25 days, the young leave the nest and form groups for the time that both parents are out hunting. of the breeding colonies depends on the landscape. Magellan penguins nest on the leeward side of the island protected from the wind. Enough sand is washed up here for them to dig holes that provide a bit of protection from predators and the summer heat. And it seems to be about that time. Some have obviously already begun to brood on their eggs.
The small island is not only something of the Mallorca of the animal world for the penguins, but also for seabirds, like this colony of cormorants, for example. The cormorant nests look like small cakes built with sand and layered with the massively abundant bird dropping guano. This gathering at the breeding grounds is based on the swarming principle. For attackers from the air, it seems to be a single organism. The abundance of fish in the ocean off the coast of Patagonia attracts many types of animal, the same way popular cities and prosperous countries attract us humans. And there, where life is good, it makes good sense to produce offspring and raise them. But nature gets pretty rough when it comes to the procreation of species. Only the strongest sea lion bulls prevail. The battles between these strong creatures are intense and they give no quarter for the sake of the younger bulls. And when it comes to behavior toward the females of the harem, romantic wooing of the object of affection? Forget it. The females of the harem respond to the procreation instinct, but mating with such a rough individual is certainly no fun. The breeding drive makes the heavy bulls aggressive toward other suitors, and they become virtually crazed. Time and again, that costs the lives of young animals. They are simply crushed. The loved crazed fights among the bulls, however, is not the greatest danger facing the young animals. That is lurking for them in the ocean. They feel safe in shallow water, but of course they don't know about tidal swells, so they can't imagine what the orcas patrol right off the beach means. highly intelligent killer whales wait for a particularly large tidal swell, such as those that occur at full moon. At those times, even the water a few meters offshore is deep enough for them to get to their prey, the young seals. For humans, the full moon means romance, or, in some unfortunate cases, the inability to get to sleep. For the seals and sea lions along the coast of Patagonia, it means the countdown. 
to merciless hunting scenes. Conditions are perfect for the orcas. The weather has taken a turn for the worse and the surf is high. The predators can't be seen from the perspective of the young animals and their good eyesight doesn't help them much in the murky water either. The pending disaster can only be seen from the elevated position of the cameraman. The young animals are simply following their instincts. The water is their element. The orcas proceed carefully, waiting for the right wave. This method of hunting is dangerous for them as well. If they get it wrong, they can become stranded on the beach and be suffocated as their great weight presses on their lungs. But hunger presses them on to risk getting closer to the beach than what is actually good for them. Several unsuccessful attacks, the orca succeeds. He grabs one of the seals. But what causes the young animals to keep going back into the water in spite of the obvious danger? It is their instinct and the typical inexperience and naivete of youth. We are familiar with that phenomenon in our own children and youth. Recognizing and avoiding danger is a matter of experience. But if all animals on Earth went about gathering food as intelligently and efficiently as we humans do, the food chain would have been destroyed long ago and most animal species would be extinct. Only the interplay of life and death, hunting and being hunted, maintains the diversity of nature. So in fact, nature is less a paradise and more a system of merciless self-preservation that we as humans have been able to escape over the course of evolution, at least to an extent. Patagonia is fascinating raw nature and provides us with unique insight into the reality of life. Hollywood films about marine animals distort the picture. The great white shark has been stigmatized into a deliberate murderer and the orca into a poor circus animal confined against its will. Here in Patagonia, he proves that his second name, Killer Whale, fits him well. What you have seen looks like a seal slaughterhouse, but the orcas are also simply following their instincts. It could seem like the orcas become more and more blood crazed with each successive kill, but that would be a human evaluation of the event. It rather has to do with the building up of sufficient fat reserves to survive the hard times. Even if the scene suggests a real feasting frenzy, the fact is that after every successful kill, there is a long phase of patient waiting and further unsuccessful attempts. Something like uncontrolled hunger would be a fitting term for the orcas eating one young seal after the other.
Whether seals and sea lions feel anything similar to human sadness or fear has not been sufficiently researched. But not hearing the voice of her offspring seems to be a very fearful situation for the mother animals. This sea lion mother and her cub have obviously survived today's orca attack. But what will happen tomorrow? Patagonian's coasts are wild and primeval. Nature demonstrates its entire spectrum, from its incredible beauty to the merciless reality of life. Returning from here to our civilized world makes it easier to deal with the shortcoming of our daily lives. That is just the way it is.